In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels unaware. From an older translation, which I really like. This line from the letter to the Hebrews tickles the imagination, does it not? I think we should hear, this is a grammar instruction, an also, or an and, making those first two sentences into one. Let mutual love continue, and do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Then as now, when encountering strangers in our midst, we sometimes resist paying them any attention whatsoever. We use our imagination to create some other kind of narrative other than a holy or trusting narrative. And so for the original audience who were dealing with persecution and all other kinds of assaults, they were probably quick to jump in their imaginations to a risk and a danger mindset when dealing with someone they did not know. We don't deal with this as Christians in the United States, but others do elsewhere in the world, and we must remain ever aware of that. I think what gets in our way sometimes is that we forget who else is present with us in all our doings. We forget to make space for God in our chance encounters, whether because we feel pressed for time or because we feel afraid and are looking down on them. Before attending seminary, I spent about 18 months serving as a hospital chaplain two or three days a week. I would go in on an ordinary day and make my rounds, visiting whoever was on the list. On one particular day, I entered a patient's room. It was dark and quiet. As my eyes adjusted to the scene, I thought that the guy laying in the bed looked kind of scruffy, like they hadn't even bathed him before they put him in this supposedly sterile environment. And so I just started to use the, my imagination, the one of trot and mistrust, and started to make assumptions about who this guy was and thinking, how quickly can I get this over with and get on to the next patient who will clearly be more deserving of my time and attention. Totally unfair. He told me that he had had a major heart attack, but it wasn't his first. He said to me, and this is an exact quote that I will never forget, I'm not afraid, see, I already died. I'm like, okay. <laughs> 30 years ago. And I learned then that death is not to be feared because when I died, I met the Lord. I could die today and it would be okay. He went on to say that when he was revived, he was a completely different person. Now, he didn't have this experience and get scared by something Jesus told him. There was no weird event on the other side. He was just different. Nothing he had to do. His wife said she could barely recognize him. He had been so changed by this encounter with the Lord. So he gave up on every one of his former habits. And he dedicated the 30 years from that event to the day I met him, doing everything he could for this little tiny community that he lives in north of Marquette. He grows an enormous garden every summer and gives everything away. See, he's watching too. He has his eye on the community also, but not to judge and not to exclude, but to notice when that new mom is looking a little thin that he might put a box of food on her porch while she's sleeping that night. Or that he might notice the little kid at the bus stop whose jacket has gotten too short. 
that he might find a used jacket from somewhere else, wash it up, put it on that kid's porch. He's a watcher now. Now, I would have missed all of that if I had just gone with my first instinct to kind of overlook him because of his exterior appearance. He's one of those people, though, who if you take the time to really see him, then you feel right away that he's living his life, walking a little closer to the Lord than the rest of us. Now, his wife and grandson were there. So I'm, people say stuff in hospital beds, and I've never met this man before. I have a name, an age, and a partial diagnosis. That's all I know, right? So I'm looking at his wife and his grandson. I'm just trying to gauge how things are going. And his wife looked at me and she said, yeah, I know. And I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. This is not the man I married. It has been an incredible 30 years of this transformation. Okay. I look at the grandson. He's just kind of shaking his head and laughing a little. And I thought, yeah, this is making him uncomfortable. I'm going to find out what's really going on. I said, you don't look comfortable. What's going on with you? And he said, my grandfather is the most amazing person I've ever met in my entire life. Everything he says is true. This is who he became. I stayed with them a little longer. The feeling of the room was just amazing. The light in this family was worthy of my time. I had nothing to offer them. Nothing. (laughs) It was me who was blessed in that encounter. In the way in which their lives humbly testified to how God blesses us in our life. We just take the time to notice. It was easy to imagine this man watching those around him in a very different way from the Pharisees and lawyers in today's story and how they are watching Jesus, waiting for him to slip up. It's different, isn't it? It's about imagination. This man had a holy imagination and not this distrusting imagination that we are just seems to be kind of our first go-to when we think about how things could turn out. Now, this man, having occupied his every day with sacred watchfulness, has learned something about Sabbath, has he not? We can keep Sabbath pretty much every day of the week. Holiness can happen anywhere. To experience the fullness of Sabbath, as you know, we set aside time to honor fully God with intentionality. Now, the Pharisees and lawyers could not argue against that. Their struggle was not knowing that they are in God's presence when they are in the presence of Christ. They know all the rules, which were intended to create a sense of stillness, so that God's presence may be more keenly experienced. But being human, they've forgotten that the rules are supposed to point 